This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Thanks for joining us. We're usually at Likeable Science, we talk about sort of fun, interesting kinds of topics. We're going to take a little bit of a sidestep today, but it's a, it's a topic that uh, has a lot to do with science, actually, and with really everyone's, everyone's daily lives. So uh, we're going to be exploring the topic of sexual harassment, and here to help me today is Makana Chai. Welcome, Makana. Thank you, Ethan. Makana is an attorney, uh, author, speaker, coach, all kinds of good things she does has uh, written a number of books, has including a book on sexual harassment, right? Represented uh, people on both sides, guilty and not guilty, men and women, uh, been a victim of sexual harassment, uh, been, had inadvertently sexually harassed someone, uh, has, uh, given trainings to companies in what, 38 states or something on, yes. on sexual harassment. So uh, a lot of great experience in, in the field and, and um, Let's just uh, jump into it, but before we start that, I want to do one of my little campfire stories here. Uh, these are stories typically from the world of nature that, that have seemingly marginal relation to the topic at hand, but this, this one is, is funny, I think you'll see. So years ago, I used to work in a uh, laboratory that studied reptile reproductive, reproductive biology. Okay. And we in particular uh, were working with some of the strange games that uh, reptiles play with their reproductive systems, which are many and varied. But this particular one was temperature-dependent sex determination, or TSD as scientists call it. So unlike people and mammals, some reptiles, whether they are male or female, is determined by what temperature they are incubated at as in, in the egg, you know, during some part of the incubation. If they're, in the case of the leopard geckos that we studied, if they're incubated warm, they turn out male. If they're incubated cool, they turn out female. Now, of course, being curious scientists, my, my lab boss, basically said, what happens when you put it right on that sort of borderline <laughs> temperature, right? Where you're not really going to get the males, you're not really going to get the females. What's going to happen to those animals? And th those animals that were incubated at just that, that narrow midline temperature were very interesting. They appeared physically to be females, but their brains had been masculinized. They, they thought of themselves as male, basically. And this, as you right away, a male brain in a female body, you, you know there's going to be trouble, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, because they would then, for instance, approach females to breed. And of course, the females took this as some other female being hyper aggressive to them and didn't respond very well at all. Mm -hmm. Conversely, males would approach them to breed. And of course, they would respond very aggressively back to them. So they, these were very unsuccessful animals reproductively. But you can see, in a sense, they were both being harassed and harassing, you know. So in that sense, it does tie into the, today's topic. But moving out of the world of animals and into the, the, the world of people, let's just start with some basic, a basic definition here. I mean, sexual harassment sort of has some clear meanings, right? It does and it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So there's um, actually three meanings. And I like to show an upside down triangle to show that there are actually three definitions. There's the legal definition, a company policy definition, and a values definition. Okay. So from a legal perspective, first of all, it's important for everyone to remember that harassment law only applies in the employment context. So for example, Harvey Weinstein did not employ most of the women who he assaulted. So they couldn't sue for sexual harassment, but they could sue for uh, assault, personal injury, and they could file criminal cases if the statute of limitations hadn't run. Um, but harassment law only applies to the employment context. It could be employer to employee, to co-employees, or it could be an outsider coming in and harassing an employee. So given that context, there are four factors in order to be illegal. The first is it has to be either sexual or gender-based. So gender-based could be Things, for example, we've seen women scientists say that they've been told by other scientists, women don't make good scientists, okay. or you're not going to get that grant because you're a woman. And so that would be sexist or gender harassment. Mm -hmm. And then sexual harassment is related to uh, sexual uh, relations or sexual activity. The second factor is that it must be unwelcome by the victim. So most behavior is presumed welcome. So there are some behavior those the courts presume is unwelcome. What would you think would be the kinds of behavior that a court would 
assume women don't welcome or men don't welcome? Being groped. Being groped, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so kind of the big three areas, <laughs> here, here, and here. Right. Um, those are presumed unwelcome. Mm -hmm. But most other things, like I asked this question recently in a training and someone said, oh, well, sexual innuendos. Those are not presumed unwelcome. Uh, swearing is not presumed unwelcome. Mm -hmm. Even calling people names is not presumed unwelcome. Oh. So what that means is that someone has to say, I don't appreciate that, mm -hmm. either to the person or to their human resources mm -hmm. department. Then the third factor is um, it must be so severe, it interferes with the person's ability to do their job. So for example, on my website, we have a feature called Ask the Lawyers, and people send in questions. And I just got one from someone who asked, is it illegal if my boss on one occasion in front of someone else calls me an F and B? And uh, the answer is no, it's not illegal. So um, the law prohibits a very narrow range of behavior. If, if they did that repeatedly. That if they did it repeatedly, maybe. You can make, some more you can make more of an argument, right. but a court would really want to see even more right. what, things What's the happen. real impact? What's the impact yeah. on their job? Right. right. And then the fourth factor is the company or the employer knew or should have known and did nothing. So if a supervisor, manager, owner harasses, that fourth factor is met. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a legal definition. Mm -hmm. But again, it's, it's a very narrow definition. Mm -hmm. So that's why we talk about companies setting a higher standard. Right. Why do you think a company should set a higher standard? Well, yeah, if, if it's so hard to prove and it, it, it allows a great deal of unwanted, crude, unnecessary, counterproductive behavior then to occur, but still not meeting the definition of illegal, right? Mm -hmm. and so that's clearly not in the company's best interest. They're going to have unhappy staff. They're going to have people who don't feel safe in their workplace. Exactly, uh, yeah. exactly. So you want to set a higher right. standard right. culturally. And then also you want to fail safe mm -hmm. because you don't want to wait till someone does something illegal before you terminate them. You right. want to, usually people, harassers, bullies, test. And they test lots of people, mm -hmm. and they test in lots of ways. So they start off uh, usually very simple, and then they go further and further. Mm -hmm. So we want to have a fail-safe. Mm -hmm. And then at the top are our values. Right. But actually, values um, go all the way. So Harvey Weinstein had values. They just happen to be beneath <laughs> the law, right? <laughs> OK. But some people, their values are way above the law. Right. So a company doesn't necessarily have to honor those values. They may choose to, mm -hmm. but they don't necessarily have to. So for example, I had a client who, an employee after a couple of days of work, said she was being harassed because the men got too close to her. And when they asked, well, what do you mean by too close? She said she wanted the men to stay at least 10 feet away. Whoa, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so. You know, maybe in some environments or some jobs, they could have accommodated that. Right. But they said, this job, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. So you have a choice. You can either stay or leave. Mm -hmm. And she ended up leaving. Mm -hmm. But she can't claim harassment just because it violates her values. Right. So that's why I think it's so confusing. Mm -hmm. Because people say, I've been sexually harassed. And it includes everything from a date gone wrong to assault. Right. And those, not all of those things are sexual right. harassment. And there's very, because it does involve personal values, there's very different personal values about, you know, some people do have very different personal distances that they're comfortable with. Exactly. People from different cultures may be more or less comfortable touching people differently, you know. Uh, yes. I mean, who can forget that great picture of George W. Bush and the king of Saudi Arabia walking hand in hand. I mean, that was... Just seeing that, that was really sort of odd, like, huh? Exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's throughout Saudis, the Middle East. A, a perfectly it's normal thing. Perfectly you know? normal, yeah. exactly. Yeah, in fact, um, when I talk about harassment, I spend a lot of time talking about values. Mm -hmm. And I'll ask people to say what their values are, and people always say respect. Well, different cultures define respect differently. Right. And men and women can define respect differently. Right. So, for example, in the Middle East and India, it's very disrespectful to look someone in the eyes. Mm -hmm. But the way I was raised, you know, my mom would say, look me in the eyes when I'm talking to you. Right. right? So that's very respectful. So if you get one person from one and one from the other, they can feel very. Yeah, uh, that, that would sink. Yes, know. exactly. 
Yeah, I, and I mean, some of it gets to be pretty clear. You read some of these cases in, in the, the world of science, and, and you know, uh, sexual harassment has been making the news in science these days. In 2017, Science Magazine listed sexual harassment as one of its breakdowns of the year, one of its three major bad things that happened in science. Mm -hmm. uh, sexual harassment is, is here and there. It's in the, in the Honolulu paper here, just after Christmas. But in the world of science, it's been rocked by some very bad cases, uh, particularly this past year, of people, particularly out at field sites, particularly with senior male researchers and their younger graduate or postdoctoral female associates. Mm -hmm. uh, one in Antarctica, particularly where this person, apparently this guy, multiply, multiple times shoved this woman, pushed her down off sizable cliffs, harassed mm -hmm. her verbally, blew volcanic dust into her eyes, uh, which was potentially blinding. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. made all kinds of sexual innuendos, apparently, including that she sleep with the other guy uh, on, on the, in the team. And, you know, he, he is, since he is out of his position, by the by. Good. <laughs> Some, he conflicted with somebody's values and some employer's uh, yeah. standards, for sure. Well, uh, I mean, that's clearly yeah. illegal. Yeah. So. Um, Once you start shoving people off cliffs. <laughs> right. <laughs> we draw the line there. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but it happens everywhere. It, it probably, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, it, it, yeah, I think it tend, would tend to happen more in uh, workplaces that are more dominated by one sex than the other. The, yes. mi the minority sex probably gets experiences more harassment. Right. It's definitely male-dominated professions where women tend to get harassed and female-dominated professions where men get mm -hmm. harassed by women. Mm -hmm. And I did represent a man who was sexually harassed um, by his, uh, he worked for a women's organization. Mm -hmm. And they um, put him down for being a male. They said that he wasn't a good person, you know, because he was a man, he wasn't a good person, and um, all kinds of, I can't even say on television what they did to him. Uh -huh. But uh, it, there's kind of a um, group mentality or... Yeah. And it, it seems so needless too, right? I mean, it's funny, but I was thinking back in this, and when I worked in this reproductive biology lab, actually most of the people in this, in this these two associated labs, most of them were, were women. And I used to regularly find myself out on a Friday evening drinking a few beers and realize I'm sitting there in a group of 10 or a dozen women. I'm the only guy. And they'd get to a little bit of male bashing and all, and they'd periodically turn to me and say, you know, no offense, right? <laughs> <laughs> and none was taken. Uh -huh. uh, but, uh, you know, it, it was all fine. Uh, but, yeah, I can get, it can, the, the sort of herd mentality can be very uh, corrosive, actually. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, the, the other thing, when we touched on this, is, is culture, right? I mean, different cultures view male-female relationships very differently, and what, what is appropriate behavior in one culture may be very inappropriate in another culture, right? Yeah, we, I've been ta talking with some friends about France, because Bridget Bardot and Catherine Deneuve mm -hmm. have come out and talking about sexual harassment and the claims against Weinstein, and they've kind of taken a different perspective on it. Um, Especially uh, Brigitte Bardot has said, well, you know, women always use their feminine wiles to get parts, and that's mm -hmm. the way it's always been, and what's the big deal? I'm not sure that I, any, we would necessarily agree with that, but it reminded me of some research that was done some years ago where they asked both women in France and women in the United States a case study. They said, your boss tells you he has a, a weekend home in the country, and he'd like to invite you there for the weekend to discuss a promotion. Is this harassment? And basically, you know, 98% of the American women said yes, and 98% of the French women said no. Intriguing. Let's follow up on that when we come back, but right now I'm told we have to take a quick break. Uh, you're here on Likeable Science. McConnell Research Eye is with me. We're talking about sexual harassment. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, and we'll be back in one minute. Hey, aloha, Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. This is the place to come to think about all things energy. We talk about energy for the grid, energy for vehicles, energy in transportation, energy in maritime, energy in aviation. We have all kinds of things on our show, but we always focus on hydrogen here in Hawaii because it's my favorite thing. That's what I like to do. But we talk about things that make a difference here in Hawaii, things that should be a big changer for Hawaii, uh, and we hope that you'll join us every Friday at noon on Stan Energy Man 
and take a look with us at new technologies and new thoughts on how we can get clean and green in Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. And you're back here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today in the Think Tech Studios is Makana Rizertrai. Makana is an attorney uh, who has dealt with sexual harassment issues and studied them, spoken on them, trained companies around the, the country on, on this. And we were just talking about sort of cultural differences, uh, different groups who perceive male-female roles differently and, and what's okay and what isn't okay very differently. But fundamentally, this really does get down to sort of the psychology of it, right? Uh, you know, what's, and what's going on? I mean, in some sense, sexual harassment is not, is not really about sex necessarily, right? Right, yes, it often is about control or mm -hmm. power. So when psychologists have studied harassers, there are a number of categories. There's narcissists, mm -hmm. who basically are all out for themselves. There are psychopaths. Well, psychopaths have jobs too. Mm -hmm. Bullies, who may not necessarily fall into either of those categories, but uh, they'll bully men and women equally sometimes. Mm -hmm. And um, some of those three, as well as others, may have been abused or bullied as children. So they're you know, using that experience to bring into the world and that's how they're, they've learned to relate to people. <laughs> so I like to think of us as you know, being on a bell-shaped curve. Mm -hmm. And there are the saints on one end who are never going to do anything. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand are the flawed people that we've just been talking about. But most people are in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, their hearts are in the right place. Right. Brains maybe not so much. Right. Uh, so that's why we need harassment prevention training to get their brain in the right place. But um, I don't think there's a whole lot that we can do about the bullies and the psychopaths or the narcissists except empower victims to speak up, make sure companies respond appropriately, and empower allies or bystanders. Mm -hmm. to let, if somebody sees something, not to just stand there, or walk away, but instead to do something. Yeah, because it's very important that, that we establish these norms, right, and, and what is okay and what isn't okay. If you experience something that's not, not okay by you, you've got to say it. And you, you put this, McConnell wrote a very nice little uh, article, it's up on our web page, and uh, just sort of talked about this, that you, one of the best things is immediately to, to come right back to the person and say, hey, I'm uncomfortable with that, that, that was, I found that an offensive remark or whatever. Uh, just to let them know right off the bat, like, hey, there's no mistaking this. You know, I'm, I'm not going to let that slide and come back at you three months later and tell you I, I didn't like it when you did that. You know, right yeah. away. Yeah, I've, I have had the experience mm -hmm. of someone coming back later where um, I had hired a young man to work for me. And after a couple months, it was right at Christmas time, and we went out for lunch. And at the end of lunch, I said, um, you don't have to come back to work today. He was on his way on vacation. Uh, Merry Christmas, and I gave him a hug. He came back a week later and said, I felt sexually harassed. Mm -hmm. So I immediately, of course, I'm thinking, is this harassment? Is it severe? Is it, you know, mm -hmm. um, I decided, no, it's not harassment. But what I said is, I am sorry. Mm -hmm. I am so sorry. I did, it wasn't my intention, and it'll never happen again. And then I walked around on eggshells for six months. But then after six months, he said, you know what? I realized that I misinterpreted what you did, and mm -hmm. it wasn't. So he apologized to me. Okay. Well, that's good. But often what happens when people try to say to someone that's offensive is they get an argument. Right. You're being too sensitive. Right. You're being emotional. I do this with everybody. And in that situation, you then have to realize, okay, this isn't working, and then talk to human resources or their supervisor or your manager to resolve the situation. Right, because people will try to invalidate your feelings as, as a... As, Again, it's a sort of a classic bullying technique, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, and you, you can't let that happen. Or mm -hmm. Pretty soon you have, you become a doormat, right? Right. And, and then the other hard part of it is when the person is in a position of power and you feel powerless. So to speak up to your manager, and most harassment 
happens among lower paid women and women of color. Mm -hmm. So housekeepers, for example, are often um, victims of harassment and other people in that uh, service workers um, are in those positions. And for them to say, I find that offensive, could mean the difference between them going to their home that night or being homeless. Mm -hmm. So in that situation, they have to go to human resources and they may not be able to speak up. Yeah, yeah, it's a very, very awful choice to, to face that. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the, the classic sort of casting couch scene in Hollywood, there's almost more of a, at least from the harasser's viewpoint, of a quid pro quo kind of thing, right? You know, I'm asking you to do this in return I will give you this. Right, you know? and of course, quid pro quo harassment is illegal too. Right. But um, it is and it isn't. I mean, uh, what we see with Harvey Weinstein is, and Louis C.K., the comedian, was that a lot of women who were just starting out were going to see him. Mm -hmm. And I actually found a video clip of Courtney Love being asked, what advice do you have for young uh, women getting into acting? And mm -hmm. she said, if Harvey Weinstein invites you to a hotel, don't go. <laughs> Really? Okay. Yeah, so um, he was, and this was in 2005 wow. when she said this, so. Isn't it amazing how long some of this takes? And again, a lot of these cases in, in the world of science are things that happened years ago. This one woman who I was telling you about waited till she had gotten her degree, had gone through postdocs, had gone through her assistant professorship, and finally got tenure. And right after she got tenure, then she turned right back around. And now she was safe, basically. She was protected right. from anything he could try to do against her, basically. And he, she had not felt safe before. Yeah. And people have been asking, why is this happening now? You know, mm -hmm. Why did the Me Too movement happen mm -hmm. now? And one um, article I read by a psychologist that made sense to me was that during the 2016 election, the um, Access Hollywood tape, came out with mm -hmm. Donald Trump saying that he had grabbed a woman by mm -hmm. the private parts. And I know for myself and a lot of my friends, what came up for us were things that we had repressed mm -hmm. for decades. Mm -hmm. I actually was raped in 1978 by an ex-boyfriend who I hadn't seen in six months and broke into my house. And I completely repressed it. I had completely forgotten about it. And when this tape came out, I remembered it. So then when he got elected, despite that, and then there was the Women's March the day after the inauguration, women started talking to each mm -hmm. other. And one of the things that we know historically that happens in countries all over the world is that if people can't fight the person at the top, they'll fight their supporters, they'll fight their people who are like them and try to undermine that person mm -hmm. or get their revenge in essence against those people. Mm -hmm. So. I don't know if that's why it's happening now, but it certainly was an interesting psychological theory. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and there is, you're right, you're right. There's a sort of a, in, in some sense, our president has made it okay to verbalize feelings, opinions that for a long time, basically, it was not okay for leaders to do. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's, so whether that's more of it just now coming out, uh, and, I mean, times do change, values do change, right? Cultural norms change. I mean, this whole thing has made me look back on my behavior, and there are instances many years ago, I did things today I wouldn't really think of doing, and I would certainly think twice about before doing. Uh, I just seemed perfectly innocent and fine at the time, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I was just thinking this morning, you know that famous picture of Times Square, the sailor kissing the nurse on right. VE Day? Right. That can never happen again. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, you're right. Uh, you, you can't just approach a stranger and do that without <laughs> right. <laughs> right? slap the lawsuit immediately. <laughs> uh, that's very. That's very peculiar. Very peculiar. Yeah. Um, so, what can be done? Well, from a company perspective, they have to make sure that their policies are in order. A lot of companies' policies are just direct quotes from the law, so they mm -hmm. want to make sure their policies set a higher standard than the law. They want to have training. And the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission now recommends that companies not only train not to do harassment, but also train on how to create a respectful workplace mm -hmm. and how to empower bystanders to intervene. Mm -hmm. I've been teaching that for decades, but huh. the EEOC finally caught up. Good, good. <laughs> um, so from a company perspective, that's what we can do. Oh, in terms, I did want to mention about Aloha. 
mm -hmm. because uh, you know we live in Hawaii, mm -hmm. and so often we embrace when we meet each other. Right. And some men can take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I recently met a man, and I stuck out my hand to shake his hand, and he pulled me in to to hug me, but I really didn't want to hug him. Mm -hmm. Or uh, they'll. You know, you'll hug them in a nice little ha hug, and they'll kind of snuggle, mm -hmm. or they'll thrust their pelvis at you, mm -hmm. um, or they'll force you to kiss them mm -hmm. on the lips. Mm -hmm. So um, none of that is aloha, mm -hmm. and let's not do that anymore. No, no. And then I suggest that women um, and men, when they meet each other for the first time, indicate whether they what they welcome. Mm -hmm. So if you hold open your arms, that mm -hmm. means you welcome a hug, mm -hmm. and if you Hold out your hand. That means you welcome a handshake, right. and this trumps this. Right. Yeah, and there are uh, yeah, very, very. Yeah, you, know, you have to be more attuned, I guess, these days than, than we used to. It's mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it's quite a. Uh, quite a so, do you see the situation changing, getting better, getting worse? I well, you know, I was interesting that the amount of sex offenders who have been registered keeps going up. Mm -hmm. um, whether that has to do with the availability of pornography, whether does people are being reported more often, but just in general, we know that sex offenses are going up. Um, so I imagine that there's going to be some period of time where we're, we're like this, that there's mm -hmm. going to be a lot coming up, that women are going to be bringing up things that happened in the past as well mm -hmm. as things that happened yesterday, and we're, it's going to take some time to work through it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I told you before the show I was going to ask an off-the-wall question here, and so now, now is the here time. Here we go. Right, here we go. So, if you could have a superpower of either being able to fly or being invisible, which would you choose and why? I would choose invisibility. Really? Yes. And why? Uh, I don't like flying. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. And I would love, I mean, there's so many situations where I would love to be in the room when something's happening uh -huh. and be able to observe it, without, you know, yeah. without them knowing that, I've, that I'm observing it. Excellent. Well, one, wonderful. Thank you, Makana. It, it was a pleasure having you here. Oh. I, I enjoyed our conversation, <laughs> learned a lot, as I had in my previous conversations with you. And I uh, hope we'll get together again soon. And I hope you will come back and see us here on Likeable Science next week. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Signing off from Likeable Science for another week.